recording in progress. They um, had everyone record locally using Audacity so they could get a wave file of the audio. And they had everyone clap to synchronize the wave files and they got everyone to send their independent wave files and are editing them together so that everyone so that the podcast is made of the wave file version of what was recorded locally by each person. Like so when I'm speaking it would be from my microphone, when you're speaking it would be from your microphone. Crazy, right? Who's this? I don't know. Maybe they're using someone else's account. Let them give them a second to rename themselves. <laughs> now we know that they know Jenny Freitas. Uh, yeah, that would be my wife. <laughs> How's it going? How do I change that? Well, hello. Uh, right click or click your dot, 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 and let's choose rename. Uh, rename. Just counseling everyone in the socialist town hall to do that. I had to rename Phil on him, though. That is my name. Axel. How are you? Good. Nice to actually meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah, I feel like we're two of the more legit folks around here. <laughs> I couldn't uh, agree more. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I actually live here. Our opponents don't. Uh, likewise, uh, I live here, too. My we're just weird, though. You can't see my, my street. <laughs> we're just waiting for more people and I'm also waiting for my co-host. Here comes Pierre's but, iPhone. Which you haven't... Uh, you, you haven't met uh, my co-host yet. Uh, I have a new co-host. Amazing. It's not Kareem Assad, is it? No, her name's Ebony. Guess what? Kareem Assad is going to moderate a mayoral debate. Oh, that one, uh, the one that Sarah's doing? Or... Virtual, yeah. Interesting. I mean, I suggested that she get John Verbeke to moderate, but I'm not sure if she emailed him. I noticed there's a name missing from her debate. Uh, Re Reginald said no. I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, we're just waiting for everyone to uh, come in, guys. So uh, we'll, we'll be starting shortly. I've given you guys permission to record if you guys want clips for your website. This is going up on YouTube tonight. Um, it'll be the next thing that I do. Although I just literally got Ward 6 up. So um uh there's a lineup but you guys will get on tonight because i'm not going to sleep until it's all done oh good the mayoral debate that i did last saturday will be on spotify at 6 a.m tomorrow morning for those who would prefer to listen to it on spotify instead of youtube i know it because of the the the, the virtual aspect of it sometimes it's it's hard to watch but listening to it i can listen to that all day it was amazing, Matt, the virtual mayoral debate. I waited my entire life to see mayoral candidates actually talk. This is my co-host, Ebony. Oh, hi. Hello. I love it. You you got the hair out. Yeah, my baby pulled it down, and then um, I got that metal clip, like, stuck in my hair. That's why I'm a little bit late. My husband just had to extricate me. <laughs> uh, husbands are for Actually reminds me a bit when I was a child. Um, I've always had curly hair. And I went to took one of those round brushes that you meant to do blowouts with. And I just rolled my bangs up in it and promptly got it firmly stuck. He had to put my head in a vise and cut it out. So oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> you live, you learn. Here. You have beautiful uh, curls too. Look at that. A little, little tangly though. I've been out in the wind all day. Enjoying the seasons changing. Oh, uh, well, I was down at Young and Dundas with Sisters of Solidarity. Fantastic. Amazing event. I made me realize that we need to get yellow smoke bombs for the Socialist Alliance. It does take great photos, that's for sure. Yeah, the photos? I'm in Toronto. Wow. Oh, I was saying I meant to come to Toronto. I usually come out to um, the Every Child Matters event. Um, I was doing this today. So, you know, but I'm, I'm here in solidarity in my orange shirt. Great. So thank you for supporting. Really appreciate it. We're waiting for one other person that's confirmed, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And if they join, they can uh, join in. So this is how it's going to work. Uh, I'm going to bring us. I'm going to bring you in and introduce you, and then uh, you each will give a two-minute uh, um, introduction. You can talk about your platform, why you wanted to run, whatever you want to talk about. And then uh, we'll get into the questions. There's three sets of questions. Ebony and I will each ask a question for each set. 
Uh, you guys will each answer it. Then we'll, there'll be a debate period. And so we'll do it on three different topics and then we'll do a closing uh, statement. Um, and then uh, I, I'm, I'm excited. So we're gonna get started. Welcome to This Time in History, guys. I'm Matthew, and we're here again with the Ward 11 virtual debate. With me, as always, is my co-host, my partner in crime, Ebony. Hey there. So uh, for the listeners, this is going to be uh, much like the other debates. Each candidate is going to get a two-minute uh, introduction to talk about their platform or whatever they like, and then we'll get into the series of questions, a debate for each set, and then the, the closing statements will be the last thing we do. Uh, we'll do this on uh, who showed up first, so we'll start with Adam, then we'll go to Axel, and then Pierre. If anyone else joins in while you guys are talking, they can join at the end, and then uh, we'll go from there. So, Adam, you're up. Okay, great. Well, you said two minutes, right, Matt? Yeah, but it's flexible, but yeah. Okay. Well, basically, um, I've lived in Ward 11 for 20 years. I was also born here. I've followed politics and ideas very closely during my 10 years at U of T and in student politics, where I was a two-term student president. And for a while, I was focused on cultural organizing, building concerts, house concerts, and open mic I was running, and so on. And um, when well, when the news gave Hillary 98% chance of victory, I had to figure out what was the story with that bug. And I come partly from software development, trying to fix the bugs in society. And uh, when Tory sued Khalil Sayright, that was another bug. And that got me really paying close attention to municipal politics. And uh, then I got arrested at Lamport too, which um, really committed me to this project of uh, reverse engineering what had gone wrong. And what had gone wrong is um, ostensibly private security and the police but they were, uh, the chain of command is that they were instructed by John Burnside, who needs to not be voted for in this election. And they were instructed by Tracy Cook, who needs to be fired. And they were instructed by Chris Murray, who has already stepped down, gee, I wonder why. And they were under the command of John Tory, essentially, even though he officially doesn't direct police, well, we can get into that. Um, that is the rough chain of command. Those are the people who are responsible for the mass violence against citizens in our city. There are three candidates in the Socialist Alliance who are arrested on the same day. You can count on us not to give the police a blank check to do whatever they want, which is what we need in the city. We can't have police being overseen by former police, because that just means that police are overseen by no one. Um, you will see we have a lot of radical policies to address the housing crisis itself. We need to address basic needs first and defund the control freaks. We have control freaks in power. We need to fund basic needs. Um, we need to see what we can do in terms of direct cash payments for housing because we're in the middle of a crisis. We have to stop the bleeding with the evictions crisis by getting something provincially like rent stabilization. We got to work with the province on that. And, uh, you know, we need to have a daily meeting kind of like this one about the housing crisis, just like we had about COVID. Chris Glover has one every month. We need to have one every day. And uh, we need to prioritize basic needs. And uh, we're, we're wasting money on uh, being control freaks. Um, I have a lot of specific things to say about climate, arts platform, you know, decriminalizing drugs. The other thing about the housing though is we need to double vacancy tax pretty much every month. Um, you know, uh, a lot of venues have gone into business. People have been evicted from their own homes. These vacancies are very expensive to our culture and the accurate price is not reflected in what it's costing these business people who, uh, if they do the math, it's not very expensive. Just like it's not very expensive for someone to uh, die from exposure because what happened at the beginning of all this is that tory was worried about insurance premiums and in, uh, in, in, in tiny shelter fires that's why he said those shelters aren't safe they weren't safe for his budget and um, it's actually too expensive for people to die it's too expensive for our culture to be destroyed with arbitrary vacancies we need to reflect the true prices of things and that also uh, goes into carbon pricing but i'll just pause there thank you so much adam uh, axel go ahead hi uh my name is axel Arvisu. Uh, most importantly, I'm a candidate for city councillor uh, for University of Roseville, Ward 11 uh, in Toronto. Um, I was raised by an immigrant single mother uh, with very limited resources. Um, we experienced just about, about every single challenge that I can think of. Um, I'm currently the founder and the principal of a custom home uh, building company and a manufacturing firm. Um, I, I'm a husband to an amazing wife, uh, father to a wonderful kid that just turned one today. Um, I have another one in the way. Uh, I'm a friend. Uh, I, I love traveling and I like studying what works uh, around the world. Um, I attended uh, Toronto Met Metropol Metropolitan University, uh, formerly known as Ryerson University. Uh, I am a resident 
of University of Rosedale. Um, I ran a business in this world for almost 20 years. Um, I'm, I'm not here ch chasing a job because I didn't get elected in the last provincial elections. Uh, I've always said I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal, uh, and I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm a, a business-oriented person uh, who believes that hard work, communication, determination, uh, we should and we can steer uh, this city back in the right direction. Um, I have uh, the ideas, the experience, and the necessary drive and determination uh, to make Ward 11 a place where we can raise our children and uh, have a better sense of community and safety. Uh, in addition, since I was a young person, I've tried to make my community better. Uh, I took a break from, from a more altruistic causes uh, when I started my business because I needed, I needed to dedicate 24 hours 24 hours a day uh, to, to get out of, to get to get that off the ground. Uh, but three years ago, my wife and I had uh, plane tickets to move to Calgary uh, because Toronto was just simply so un unaffordable. Uh, then the pandemic hit, and and thankfully, uh, I mean thankfully and, on, and and not so thankfully, but the pandemic hit, and and our flights were canceled. Uh, we decided after all that we were going to stay in Toronto because we love the city and mostly because our family is here. Uh, now my son, my son Jack is here and, uh, and uh, I just wanna make the city better for, for, for him. Uh, and, and I want him to have op uh, opportunities uh, down the road uh, so he can grow up and he won't, uh, he, so he doesn't have to leave the city. And that's why I'm running. Thank you so much. Uh, Pierre, go ahead. Hi there, thanks for having me. My name is Pierre Terrian. I'm a retired authorized nuclear operator. I worked for 30 years in nuclear and uh, I've come into the city here to, uh, to, to bring forth a few bold ideas about how we can solve our problems. It, uh, it appears to me that Toronto is, uh, is really suffering. It's uh, many, there's, there's many problems here, but uh, my main platform issue is a solution to climate change. I think that uh, we can force the polluters to remove two tons of CO2 for every ton of CO2 they emit. And uh, the carbon tax is, is what's going to do this. And so I'm a huge proponent for the carbon tax. I think that solar cells and windmills they uh, don't really have a future here in Ontario. And so I think that that's a misguided idea to try and venture down that path. Um, I think in order to solve our problems with uh, pedestrian safety here in Toronto, we need, to, uh, we need to expand our bike lanes and we need to separate the bike lanes from the pedestrian lanes and from the cars. And for gridlock, I think we need massive new tunnels. I think we have to bury the gardener at long last and the Don Valley Expressway as well. And others, the Spadana Expressway should be built, I think. And uh, I have bold visions for these ideas. I think that we should do the same with transit here in Toronto. I think we should have a, uh, a bold new scheme to uh, use federal infrastructure money for these underground expressways and for new subway lines. I think that Toronto needs to be served by a, uh, uh, a rapid high-speed rail link going from Quebec City right through to Windsor. And I think we need to make the stop for that probably right in Ward 11. The uh, homelessness issue is an issue that can simply be resolved. We don't have to fight. We don't have to fire anybody. I think that, I think that what we have to do to resolve our homeless, homelessness issue is put housing first. And we've got we've to make sure that we, we just simply fund it completely. Um, as far as uh, the housing sector goes and the real estate industry, it's pretty clear the pundits, you know, Santo is uh, one of the, uh, from Team Sessa and other pundits as well. They're, they're very clear that our, our uh, 
the valuations on our property are collapsing. And we need to monitor this situation. And as the condo construction industry begins to collapse and they stop building all these new projects for new housing, uh, I, we need federal infrastructure money to come in here into Toronto and, and fix that. We need, to, we need to maintain the proposals for new condos that we're going to erect. We can't have any more of these condos where people are living in 500 square feet. I think we've got to raise the minimum size limits for these condos so that new immigrants coming into Toronto can have a, a more reasonable life here in Toronto. Anyways, those are most of the issues that I want to bring up and, uh, and uh, I'll look forward to your questions going forward. Well, thank you so much. So we're going to start with housing, uh, the housing crisis specifically. I think that's a that's a hot topic right now. Uh, Ebony, you can ask your question first, and then I'll go, and then uh, we'll we'll keep the order we just did. So we'll let Adam go first, and then Axel, and then Pierre will close it out, and then we'll 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 start rotating as we go forward. Uh, Ebony, go ahead. All right. Well, as we all know, housing seems to be a very uh, proliferant and unique situation in itself. I was wondering if you could all give me your best out of the box approaches on where we might be able to find the space or, you know, um, make way for affordable housing. Um, it might be unorthodox, but I want to hear your best go. And then my question would be, um, would you support uh, rent freeze and or uh, legalization of rooming houses. You're up, Adam. Okay, how many minutes should I take? Take a couple minutes, whatever you like. Like like five-ish? Okay. Yeah, sure. Five. <laughs> I mean, I'm used to open mics, so they tell me five minutes, get, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay. We we got time. Yeah, go <laughs> okay, ahead. Okay, listen. Okay, so um, <laughs> housing crisis is a crisis. Tautology to start. <laughs> it's a, This is not what everyone accepts. We have to first adopt a crisis mentality like we did with COVID, actually. And this is why we have to have a daily meeting like we did with COVID. If it's an emergency, you're going to talk with it every day. Otherwise, it's not, you're not treating it like an emergency. And um, look, we need really aggressive vacancy taxes. This is one thing people tend to single out about my platform because it's even more aggressive than the Socialist Alliance platform. Um, I mentioned this already, of course. Um, and uh, we may need direct cash subsidies. I mean, Wong Tam already proposed this in the case of just clearing out the shelter hotels. Um, if somebody says that the largest universal housing subsidy that the city can afford is zero dollars, they're incorrect. It's at least one dollar. And the debate just simply be about how many dollars can we afford in a universal housing subsidy? How many dollars can we afford in a universal rent subsidy? Um, now, there was a mention about um, um, a rent freeze. Now, a rent freeze is a bit too, um, uh, it's like a ceiling effect. You, you can't do such extreme price controls, um, you know, like central planning already experimented with this. But what you can do is you can tweak the conservative plan and merge it with the NDP plan. So the NDP plan is to have, Pierre's trying to troll me in the video. Um, what you have with the NDP plan is Jessica Bell's Rent Stabilization Act, which I'm sure he's familiar with. He's, he's, he's having a great time. He's amused with everything I'm saying. Um, Jessica Bell's Rent Stabilization Act removes the perverse incentive to evict people. That perverse incentive exists because prices keep going up for new tenants. And so if they can find any kind of reason or just incentivize you to move just by being a shitty landlord, um, they make money. They make money by doing nothing positive, nothing constructive. This is even worse than rent evictions. This is why the rent should apply to the location, not the tenant. This would immediately reduce the rate of evictions. Um, now, the conservative plan involves reducing rent control on new developments. The problem with that is that it incentivizes demolishing old developments because you can make more money with a new development because it'll be not rent controlled. So they have to change that. So yeah, you'll get more money into the city by allowing no rent control on new developments, but at a condition that it's if you're not displacing perfectly functional units because that also creates an incentive to demolish. And I live by the, if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it kind of principle that allows us to spread out more. Um, right now, um, you know, there's, there's um, those new developments, they, they will try to put them downtown if they can. We have to reduce density a little bit. We do need to, to um, build in at least subtle incentives, incentive to start spreading out a little bit more, especially in a place like Ontario. It's not like we're like, you know, like, redeveloping Rome or something like that. Like there's so much space around us, you know, there's no reason to have this so weird congestion incentive in the way rent control works. Um, 
any rate, so um, we need we need that daily meeting. We need vacancy taxes. We need real changes to rent control. We also need mental health treatment facilities. So I guess the one thing I really have to address, and then I'll stop, is housing first because this keeps coming up. It came up in the city manager's tenth annual address. He said, "Oh, a housing first. Everyone agrees on housing first. And I, as I always say with that, that just shows that Chris Murray did not read SHJN's sixty-page winter plan when we desperately needed a winter plan. In fact, Tory called the winter plan unwelcome when in fact their plan was failing. SHJN's winter plan is actually great. You should read all 60 pages of it. I am going to do something unusual and just read you what I put in the chat here. This is very important. This is what SHJN said. They are the experts, not me. They say, housing first is a failed policy in Toronto. Housing first requires that people be unhoused for six months before getting access to many supports. In the midst of a housing crisis, this is an inhumane policy. Um, they want to adopt a compassionate and universal homelessness policy, abandon the ideologically driven neoliberal policy of housing first, which forces many people to become and remain on house for six months before accessing additional supports. Uh, housing first programs uh, like that focus on chronic homelessness, quote unquote, which directs programming resources to people who have been unhoused for six months or longer. This means that the gendered nature of homelessness is not properly taken into account as unhoused women are less likely to be acknowledged and as unhoused and therefore less likely to be given access to services. And then they summarize just a little later in the article. Um, uh, yeah, there is su substantial evidence that the high rate of chronic homelessness in Toronto is a consequence of the housing crisis. With housing prices so high and incomes, especially social systems so low, many people cannot find housing. Housing first policy means that many people have to be homeless for six months and experience the likely violence and trauma associated with this before they qualify for additional assistance. Housing first is therefore a failed policy in Toronto. They put that in bold. In this article he doesn't even the city manager could have skimmed this article and seen oh yeah this group who's looked at this uh, problem in great depth releasing a 60 page report put it in bold housing first is therefore a failed policy in toronto they should be screaming it because chris murray couldn't hear them but it doesn't matter because he's already stepping down thank you so much adam axel you're up uh hi uh ebony like like you mentioned, uh, our generation is facing a housing crisis. Um, I believe we need to build inventory. Uh, and this means uh, zoning conversion in some areas of the city. Uh, I want to advocate to work with building departments to eliminate red tape uh, and address municipal inefficiencies, uh, which, can add to up, which can add up to $100,000 uh, to the cost of a new home. Um, I want to ease basement apartment conversions. Um, I plan to improve alternative housing options, such as laneways, uh, garden suites, uh, so that families can stay together and or cool down the renters and sellers uh, market conditions. Um, we also need to take a closer uh, look and fixing the backlog of, at the landlord and tenant board. Uh, investors and homeowners are scared to put their units in the market because they're afraid that they might have no recourse if they get a bad tenant. Uh, and it goes both, both ways. Uh, landlords and tenants should not have to wait more than a year to get a hearing. Um, I do support a cap on rent increases and, uh, and the resources to subsidize housing should, should be allocated to the people that really need it. Um, and I, uh, Matthew, I also support the legalization of uh, rooming houses. Thank you so much. Pierre, you're up. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. so uh, my idea is pretty short. The, uh, the Toronto real estate industry is undergoing huge transition right now. The uh, valuations on property are about to collapse. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rental market is currently a landlord's market. So the landlords are having an awesome time with renters who are trying to compete for their rentals. But this is going to shortly change. The valuations of real estate will plummet over the next few months. And they uh, and and uh, the, all of a sudden, all these people with uh, people talk about taxation for for empty rooms. Well, once all of the value comes out of these properties, you're not going to have to solve that problem anymore. The value of uh, rents, the the price of rents, is going to drop in comparison with the massive inflation we're being affected by right now. So 
it's going to become a renter's market over the next couple of months. And this is going to alleviate much of the problems that we're seeing with the high price of rentals and the high price of real estates here in Toronto. So the, the valuation of real estate will fall and it'll plummet quite a bit and it will be saved somewhat by our massive into immigration policy here in Canada. And I, I think that, uh, that that's a good idea and we need to keep up with that. But the, with, the, uh, with the construction industry already showing signs of, of collapsing the, in the condo industry, they're canceling projects already. So if uh, the next few months come along and these, uh, these condo builders can't build any more condos, that construction industry is going to collapse and Toronto is going to be in a lot of trouble then. So I think what we got to do is we've got to have federal infrastructure money. Canada's in the strongest uh, economy in the G7 right now. And the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure money is the, is we are well positioned to spend as much infrastructure money as we want to save our condo construction industry. And so I think we should just wait. And I don't think that there's any necessity for rent controls or, well, I would look into this rooming house legalization issue much more closely before I make my mind up on that. As far as how homelessness goes, uh, the housing first and harm reduction strategy have been <laughs> have been verified to be true. This has been this the, these policies have been completely carried out in Finland and also in Utah. They and while while the housing first policy may have not survived here, it may be a failure in some people's minds, but I think. I think that what's going on there is it just wasn't fully funded and adopted. I think that if you want to adopt housing first, you need a bed for every single homeless person on the street, someplace where they can sleep that's safe. Or I've talked to the police and our homeless shelter here in Toronto is dangerous. It's a place where you go to get robbed or beaten up. Why would somebody sleeping on the street want to go there? This is just utter nonsense. This is, uh, this is a complete lack of vision. It seems like uh, I, I, I walk around in downtown Toronto and I, or, or in this uh, my own ward, Ward 11, and I see the homelessness there. And, and you, you can just see the, the, uh, the despair in their faces. There's, there's no way to climb out of this homeless disaster in Toronto. Anyways, I'll finish up by saying I think bold action is required to fix that. Thank you, Pierre. And uh, before uh, I let you guys debate for a few minutes, um, I just want to add that uh, I did a recent debate today, and I was told that there the city has 26,000 empty vacant units, and we don't have 26,000 unhoused people as far as i know the That's estimates right. the, the estimates around 8000 uh but it could be a little bit higher as well uh because i know you guys are, are passionate about climate i was also told that the demolishing um companies that demolish the land so that condos are built pay no carbon tax they don't pay into it uh, you guys are free to debate. You can unmute and start where you like. All right. Housing first is not a failed policy. It's and been why did they say that? In what explains them saying that? Are you, what are you blabbing about? Sense of the you report? keep on interrupting me without waiting for me to finish well, speaking. Keep this framing. What? Keep the framing that I just suggested of what explains SHJN, the experts saying that. Yeah, SJN in Toronto has declared housing first a failed policy in Toronto. So okay. what? It works in Finland. It works. So you're not in listening Utah. to them. It's a proven policy that works. It's not proven to them. So why why aren't they convinced if the proof is is uh, a proof? 
you know? Because I haven't gotten there yet to tell them what to do. <laughs> yeah, well, you could have read the report last year and written them then. Why the report you? is garbage. Chris, it's based on have a, you read it? It's based on a failed housing policy well, that you have it. already told me Chris has Murray failed. hasn't read it. John Tory hasn't read it. It's required reading, guys. No, it's not. It's only 60 pages. And it's not that hard. Pierre doesn't do There's the no read need to him. read it. There's a better policy. Axel is just letting us destroy each other now. <laughs> Axel, what do you think about housing first? Give him a shot. That's my strategy. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> <Good violent country. laughs> yeah, have at her. Just let her go. I, I spoke to a city councilor from Brantford who said we need treatment facilities, and that's not housing. That's something else that some people need first. This is what I was saying in the chat. What well, about, sounds sounds sorry, to me like uh, twenty six thousand empty units in and amongst a collapsing real estate industry is going to resolve a great deal of that problem. The real estate, real Tax estate, is not collapsing at all. Mark my words, you can bet all your money; it's not going to collapse. And the twenty six thousand, I was to understand. I could be wrong, and I'm wrong a lot, but I was to understand that the twenty six thousand are rental units that are vacant. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. The, the the greed of the economy right now, it doesn't surprise me at all. Nope. Um, right where I'm living right now, um, as soon as the people who were living above me left last, um, I think it's the end of July, end of August, they renovated the unit and it sat empty for another like 10 months. Um, just now they've moved their son back in. So like uh, they were trying to get me to move out of my unit saying that they wanted to give their unit, this unit that I'm in to their son. And I kept saying, why don't you move him in upstairs? Um, apparently they have two sons. So I'm still not off the chopping block, but yeah, you know, it's um, a, a situation I see a lot is the, the rental price they give you for each, just the top half of a house. We're looking at like 3000 already just for the top half of a house while they live cozy in the basement. You're paying off their mortgage and lining their pockets with some spending money. This is a corrupt practice. Uh, being yes. a landlord can be uh, an ethical job. If, if anything, it should be a public service, and it should be nothing more than that. Okay, anyway, for I, 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 okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, Adam, what do you say about the uh, what I said about the um, the demolishing companies that don't pay uh, any? carbon penalties carbon tax for the the demolishing that of the whatever the properties in order to build the condos well you know it's just part and parcel of an even broader unpriced externality because the cost of the carbon emissions is one unpriced externality and then the cultural cost of demolishing things that are say functioning cultural hubs in the case of venues for instance or keeping them vacant um, that is a huge cultural cost that the the people making the money aren't paying it's a kind of cultural pollution I am okay with them not paying carbon tax because at the end of it, it's gonna be the it's gonna be the owner or the occupant that's gonna be paying that carbon tax. So I'm absolutely okay with not paying it. What I'm here about uh, from a lot of the people that I speak to on the streets that are homeowners is that they are they are scared of putting their, their units in the market because they've had bad experiences where the landlord and tenant board uh, doesn't do their job in a timely fashion and it takes them a year, a year and a half to get a hearing. Meanwhile, they're, they're put in a situation where they're having to pay the mortgage and they're not uh, being able to collect the rent. I'm not, I'm not defending them. I'm not taking a side here, but um, I'm, I'm only sharing what, what, what I hear and I, what, what I can see. And if these landlords or, or if these owners take their units off the market, it just, it's just gonna shrink the supply of uh, uh, available units. Uh, which doesn't ha doesn't help the affordability issues. Uh, I think the, the 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 province has to get their act together and get the landlord and tenant board to do their job. I think they need to put a cap on how many houses a person can own. Honestly, I think it needs um, to be like. I, I, I don't think they can put a, I don't think they're allowed to do that. I don't think, I think that's impossible. What I think they should do is they, they perhaps should put a, a, a different tax, tax bracket on a person that owns, owns more than one house. And I completely support that. Yes, something needs to be done. We people come scoop up like six houses in a row on a block 
And, and the other part of that too, is they could leave some of those um, buildings to this fall into disrepair, knowing that they're driving the property market down so they can buy more houses. They don't care how dare, like, look, I've seen plots of land sit there vacant for 10 years, just falling into dilapidation until suddenly a fire takes it because some kids are messing around. It's an entire insurance thing. You know? Go ahead, Adam. Go ahead, Adam. Um, I just wanted to mention a, a policy that we um, are overdue in reviewing. I think we'll review it on Tuesday in the Socialist Alliance that was proposed to us by uh, Yaman Kader Amin. And he said to me, um, you know, he's a policy guy formerly of the NDP, and he said, uh, we need to have a tax that is um, in increases with each additional property. So this is, not, this, again, this is like not having a price ceiling. You need curves, just like in audio, you don't want clipping. Um, th this would be, uh, you know, uh, you could do the math differently, but the idea is that your second home would be taxed more, your third home would be taxed even more. Um, I like that idea. I'm going to be advocating it to the Socialist Alliance. We may uh, put it in our platform at the next convention. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, guys. So let's move on to the next set of questions. Uh, we're Before we finish there. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So this is a uh, this is a graph of the housing prices here in well it, this is in Vaughan they're down by a half a million dollars a half a million dollars over the last nine months it's uh, that's from two million dollars two, 2.2 million dollars down to the average price of about one and a half million dollars the price of housing in Toronto is collapsing. I just wanted to make that point clear. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to crime. Uh, Ebony, go ahead and then I'll ask my question and then uh, we'll go, we'll start, we'll go with Axel and then Pierre and then Adam, you can finish us off. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ebony. All right, well, me personally, I'm not a huge fan of the cops. So I'm wondering if you can all give me your personal opinions on how we can reduce crime in neighborhoods without increasing the police presence. So again, I'm looking for out of the box answers, unorthodox, you know, around, yeah, I wanna hear out, outside the box, give me some interesting concepts. And my question would be, you know, um, there's a mayoral candidate uh, and if he wins, he's gonna reestablish carding as a tool for the Toronto police to use. How do you respond to that and why? Go ahead, Alex, or sorry, Axel, <laughs> you're on mute. No, no, Axel, you have to unmute. You're on mute. You. My mistake. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I do believe that the, the police force is necessary. Uh, I am not a fan of the phrase defunding the police because we surely need some type of authority uh, so we don't, turn, we don't turn into Gotham City. Um, the way I like to put it, though, is um, I think we have come to over rely on police enforcement. I do agree with that. Um, and uh, common sense uh, tells us that police involvement is not always necessary. In, and, and in some instances, it makes things worse. Um, you know, do we need our police officers taking accident reports or guiding traffic at an intersection or be at a construction site and, and, and on and on. Um, I am pro diminishing the scope of the police responsibilities and shifting some of those responsibilities to better equipped teams of people that meet those needs. Uh, and it also means investing more in mental health care and uh, housing uh, community programs um that's my thoughts on the police uh and i definitely uh a resounding no to bringing carding back um and what was the other point uh do you uh what was your other question matthew oh no mine was about carding yeah oh okay okay, okay. Over <laughs> thank you so much pierre you're up and you said no to carding those were the two questions yeah. Hi, yes, thanks. So um, I'm very happy to speak about this issue. Um, I, as far as the carding issue goes, if anyone brings up the idea of carding in front of me, I can assure you that I will shred this idea completely. The idea of the police being able to go up to anyone in public without any reason at all and demand for ID, I think that that is what the Germans did in Germany in World War II. I think that 
I think that this is just, this is unbelievably racist. I think that car, the carding thing has to end. As far as uh, police funding goes, I think it is possible to defund the police. And I think that there's a way to do it. And, and how you do it is you decriminalize drugs. I think, that, I think that the war on drugs is a war on our own people. I think that when we, uh, I think that when we send the police out to try and, and police the issue of drugs, I think that this, this pits them directly against the criminal drug gangs. And so, so the police are spending all of their time chasing around all these gangs, all these shootings in Toronto, all, all of this, uh, a great deal of crime in general, but also there is a tremendous sex slave issue operating right here in Toronto where, where young women from good families are, are taken away and kept drugged in hotel rooms to have sex with people. It's, it's an outrageous situation. I think that decriminalizing the drugs, I think that that's going to, and providing a, a, a known supply of drugs that do what you expect them to do. But getting a joint of marijuana with a fentanyl in it, it, or whatever it is, you know, whatever drug it is you buy, it's laced with a lethal dose of fentanyl or other drugs. It's, it's unacceptable. So I think that the I think that the drug supply needs to be made secure, and I think that by making a secure drug supply that that people know they can go and get, they'll they'll it will be cheaper. They'll find the drugs they want and and be able to to do whatever it is they choose. The prohibition of drugs must end. And since this will uh, and to Alex's point about mental health care, it needs to increase in our society. And I think that, you know, I, I have dealt personally, personally with these, with the police, and when they come with a, an assistant who is trained in mental health care, it is a huge difference having, having just that voice there. And I think that I think that by decriminalizing drugs, we will find ourselves with a kinder, gentler police that are going to be doing a little bit more of the serving rather than protecting. I also have a firm belief that the, the police, because of this war on drugs, have lost their respect for human life. And I think that, I think that a glaring example of that is the is when Mr. Yadam was shot dead on a streetcar. I think that that is that just demonstrated a complete lack of respect for human life, uh, and, and I think that, that that has to find its way into the training of new police. Thank you so much, uh, Adam. You're up. Okay. Well, it sounds like we agree on a lot of points, the three of us here, which is uh, um, encouraging. Um, you know, um, some people share a more authoritarian mi mindset in this city. Uh, the mayor is one of them. Uh, he's an authoritarian. <laughs> um, what I will say um, that I guess nobody said it explicitly that we kind of circled around it is the idea that um, we can reduce crime by defunding the police because the police are committing crimes. Um, th this is, uh, you know, um, there was a false binary in the stars uh, vote compass question where they said like, oh, or, you know, you, are you like, willing to cut property taxes, even if it means decreasing services. Well, a lot of that money is being spent on disservice. So you can cut disservices first before you cut any services and save a lot of money that way. Because they, they were not serving me the way the police acted on those days, say at the major encampment clearings, nor were they serving really much of anyone, except the people who benefited from the film contract they had to fulfill in Alexander Park. Um, I'm going to go through a couple points here for my platform. If you look on my blog um, and Substack, Adam Golding on Substack, I have a post called What I Told the Cops. It contains two depositions that I gave to the police services board uh, while I was at the time facing charges of obstructing police. But as you can see, I was actually helping them. <laughs> there are two police in my family, Neil Herdebees, OPP up in Aurelia, and uh, my grandfather was a police officer before he was a civil servant at Borden. Um, so I, 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 and my mother was a victim of domestic abuse and police saved her life multiple times. So I do not believe that a complete defund uh, at least in one election cycle, can be feminist because you have to gradually re re replace those functions. Um, that being said, I want to mention that in addition to us agreeing here, 
every candidate in the Socialist Alliance has signed on for a defund of at least 50%, okay? And three of us were arrested on the same day by uh, essentially former police who are managing police in those evictions. Um, we are all committed to oversight of the police. Um, almost none of the incumbents are because after those encampment clearings happened, uh, Leighton and Matlow proposed a judicial inquiry into what the cops did. The only incumbents running for re-election who voted for it are Gord Perks and Josh Matlow. There are no, there are zero other incumbents that you should vote for if you want any kind of police oversight or defunding. Do not vote for anyone who is currently in office other than Gord Perks and Josh Matlow. That is the only way you can have a defund vote. Uh, now for a few uh, specifics. Um, radical police reform does involve cutting by at least 50%, as I've been fond of saying, if Doug Ford can cut council in half, we can cut the cops in half. Um, and we should spend more than half of the budget on violent crime. That is the only thing that justifies the police having monopoly on violence is that they're supposed to be addressing violence and reducing it. Often they're causing it. Um, there should be democracy at work for police, but only after citizens have police oversight. So if the police have something immoral there should be that, that they're being told to do, there should be three safeguards. The public should be able to vote it down. Uh, a public council should be able to step in in real time and say, hold on, you know, stop the presses, stop the production line. We are the people. We have, set, we have hit the pause button on the cops right now. That, that should be something that there should be a quorum set that enough people should be able to set up at a meeting that they can call at any time and say pause. Um, and the police should be able to do the same thing. They should be able to take a vote amongst themselves and say, hold on, this feels fucked up because it did feel fucked up. I'm sure for most of you officers who were there on the ground at those encampments, I'm sure you're as traumatized as many of the people you traumatized. It might take you years of therapy to understand it, but you should have been able to say no as well. And I said this to you know a young girl who worked for Star Security. I said, don't you understand they're gonna do this again next week? You don't have to be here for that. And when I saw her at the next clearing and she was on, on shift, she couldn't, she couldn't make eye contact because she, know I, she knew I had told her and I could tell she didn't want to be there that day. And almost nobody wanted to be there that day or any of those three days. Um, but uh, the police have to be able to say no only if the people can also say no. Um, and individual officers need the ability to say no and be conscientious objectors. One of the things I proposed to the police services board is that you should test every officer to see if they will reject an unethical order. Uh, officers today fail that test miserably. Um, we need ranked ballots monthly on the police budget so you can have public consultation. For some reason, uh, Leighton and Wong Tam, when they had a budget town hall, I proposed this, they said, oh, that's a feature because politicians are so corrupt, basically, you can't trust them having any kind of direct influence in the police budget. Well, that's the only way the people are going to have any influence in the police budget. So unfortunately, you have to actually address corruption. Uh, in order to, to have your politicians regulating the police as well. Uh, we should maybe decentralize police training rather than centralizing in Almer, a bit of a mo monoculture. And a central point of the MSA platform is no cops in schools. Um, that is, uh, and of course, decriminalizing drugs. I just want to emphasize, I agree with that. I mean, my mom lived in Rochdale. Um, <laughs> she was there the night they evicted the entire building. I'm definitely on board to decriminalize all drugs. Um, by, by the way, you know, there, there's toxic incentives, like even drugs that aren't criminal that are like, you know, you need a prescription to get them. People should have the autonomy in most cases to, to experiment rather than needing to be like diagnosed as ill before they can try a certain medication that might help them um, because that pathologizes, you know, what is oftentimes just mental diversity. Even if someone does want to fit into a different mold using a drug in order to succeed in a certain job, you don't need to tell them that they're fucked up or that they're broken. Um, and that, that goes also hand in hand with decriminalizing drugs. And, uh, oh yeah, we should repeal the no camping bylaw, we, uh, criminalizing uh, essentially camping in parks um, you know, making it illegal, so to speak, um, is no good. And there's a lot of other stuff in that bylaw, by the way. We're all bylaw violators, including Councillor Bradford, who admitted to drinking in parks and voted to keep it illegal anyway. Um, that's against the bylaw. Uh, being in a park after midnight is against the bylaw. Swearing in a park is against the bylaw. We are all, every last one of us, filthy bylaw violators, but there is differential enforcement. That is what the Toronto Ombudsman found. Uh, one of the ways to reduce differential enforcement is to gradually repeal laws if they can't be re-justified because consent must be renewed uh, to all laws unless the law itself encodes a principle of consent. So I wouldn't propose that something like Roe versus Wade expires, but other laws that aren't about consent must expire if the consent is not renewed. And uh, that reduces differential enforcement by reducing the total number of laws. We need a lot of methods, though, to reduce differential enforcement. Uh, that in itself is its own kind of crime. And uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, the floor is yours, guys. If you uh, feel the need to uh, add anything uh, to this topic,
I'm just going to suggest that I, I did hear somebody mention after school programs. Um, I didn't hear anybody mention, um, you know, urban design or, you know, the redesigning of neighborhoods. What do you think about that? How would you implement it? Go ahead, I think Adam. That, uh, Let's I think go that, here first. Sorry. I think sorry. that, uh, I think that the pedestrian versus bike safety versus uh, cars issue, I think I'd like to re-emphasize that uh, in order to make our city, our streets just a, a little more sane, I think that, uh, I think that we have to, like, what I see going on on Bloor Street, for example, it's a very good example. There's, uh, there's construction pylons everywhere. The, the curbs that they put in to separate the bikers, in a lot of cases, they've used up a considerable portion of the bike lane. And anyways, I think that we should put some more permanent curbs in there. And I think that we should close some of the streets that are that that terminate at Bloor Street. And I think we should make those streets more quiet heading away from Bloor Street. We've done that with other streets. Uh, Vancouver has done a lot of that. But uh, I think that uh, I think that if we bury our expressways, I think that what's that what that's going to do is it's going to make it so that, you know, for instance, you're driving down Bloor Street and you, you would just drive down into a tunnel. There would just be an exit off of Bloor Street and you would drive down into a tunnel. You'd be immediately on an expressway. So this is going to this is going to reduce all the gridlock and this sense of busyness that you see everywhere. It takes a I've had some of the some of the some of the uh, constituents that I've been canvassing, they've, they've been saying that that's a major problem. They live in that bluer area. Some of them are on Shaw Street and they're saying it takes them an hour to get to the expressway. Well, you know, for people who don't want a bike or, or walk, they just wanna drive in their car, they need some sort of sanity too. But if we bring them out of the traffic mix, if we bring a lot of cars out of the traffic mix, that'll reduce a lot of the gridlock and make our, but that's just, uh, that's just a few ideas that I have to, uh, to make things a little more peaceable on the streets. All right, thanks, Pierre. Anybody else? I just want uh, to remark, oh, go ahead. Just bringing back to what you were saying, Ebony, uh, we need to allocate resources to, mental health uh, to facilities, uh, like you said, um, uh, that give people uh, speedy access uh, uh, to mental health, uh, invest in communities, community organizations. Uh, so where are we gonna uh, get that extra money? Where do you figure, like I, I have a couple of ideas that I'd like to suggest to you, but the, uh, the for instance, homelessness, in order to put in a real, in order to bring an increase to the mental health, that's what you brought up, in order to bring up a, an increase to our mental health services, how, how can we fund it? Like I, I would suggest that the carbon tax has been demonstrated as a tax on the rich. It, it, oh. it, the, the poor pay nothing. And so, right. and so in order to divert resources to mental health care or to homelessness, I vote we, we just load that carbon tax right up. <laughs> That's cops. You might want to. You might have to run for federal elections if that if that's the case. Uh, yeah. I think that obviously there's some programs that the city can uh, offer. Uh, healthcare fall, falls under the provincial jurisdiction. We definitely have to, you know, keep knocking on those doors to, to get access to more funding as, as much as we can as uh, the city of, of Toronto is one of the most important cities in, in Canada. Uh, but I think ultimately Toronto should have uh, enough of a, a budget to allocate some of these resources to communities and organizations to create opportunity for people. Uh, that's also going to alleviate crime. Um, you know, shifting uh, resources uh, to emphasize rehabilitation and mental health instead of programs like safe injections that, in my opinion, uh, may only prolong uh, the homeless or the drug crisis. Thank you. Adam, you just got his hand raised, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, 
so there was uh, i was going to remark about just one um, particular thing that i learned because ebony asked about design and crime rates um but just before i get to that i just wanted to um remark i mentioned this in the chat and uh well, I'll send it to Pierre, but he might not watch it. But I saw an episode of the Majority Report, which made the opposite claim. And so it'd be interesting to see if he disagrees with one of their premises, um, because what they concluded was that um, the carbon tax was a tax on the poor. And what they said was, uh, you shouldn't tax a molecule, you should tax the rich. Um, I've been uh, getting into the idea that, like, for instance, like, how an example. can the carbon tax be a tax on the poor? Explain that the cost is passed on to the poor. Like for instance, people who have to drive to work, they have no choice. They don't have as much choice about where they work. You know, there's a lot of poor people who commute. The carbon tax is rebated to the poor. That's nonsense. Well, maybe the policy is different in America than this was on the, ma the majority report. Uh, maybe, maybe the rebate addresses that concern. That would be interesting to put to that person. Well, um, we're talking about a Canadian carbon tax. And if politicians here in Toronto, if city well. of Toronto politicians are demanding a carbon tax, to fund homelessness and mental health care, I think you're going to catch the ear of the prime minister. I think that uh, I think that if uh, civic and provincial authorities begin to agree that the carbon tax can be made to fund transit and homelessness and mental health care, I'm going to. I think we're going to say load her up. Mm. Well, yeah, the devil is definitely in the details. I think we can probably agree that we should only accept carbon taxes, which are taxes on the rich. Um, yeah. Yes. Good. Well, okay. So I anyway, agree with you, Adam. Great. Okay. Well, that aside, I just wanted to mention something I learned at Chris Glover's Homelessness Work Group. Um, Ebony, you were talking about sort of design and crime rates. And yeah. basically what I learned is that um, nimbyism is the cause of its own complaint. Now, let me explain what that means. There was a, a researcher who came into Glover's homeless worker. I should remember his name. I'll have to look this up. And he had previously been homeless, and he was a graduate student doing research on homelessness. And he was addressing the common stigma, the idea that encampments or shelters or food banks in your neighborhood will increase the crime rate. Having shelter beds, people think, oh, if you install this shelter, you're going to create all this crime in my neighborhood. And the question, the implicit question, at least, is like, is that a stigma? Is that fair? Is that unfair stigma? Is it true? You know, because the, you, there is such a thing as a crime rate, it can go up or down. And um, what they said is that it's only true in the presence of NIMBYism, because if the NIMBYs won't accept shelters in their backyard, the shelters all get concentrated into a few neighborhoods. That's and right. Like, sorry? That's right. Yeah. And so what they said was that what you have to do is you have to spread it out, but you can't just spread out the shelter beds. You have to also spread out the services. So they said in the long-term plan is to decentralize the beds and the services so that you, you spread it out through the city um, and so you don't hit that threshold where there then becomes a spike in crime and that's also because these people lack social mobility if they're not around anyone who can sort of pull them up a bit if you put all the poor people in one place well they can't loan each other any money to do anything can they you know who are their investors you know um, at any rate so um, they, they proposed doing that now they also had a plan to do it to get it started they wanted to put um, sort of little homes on wheels um, not the, the Khalil style ones exactly, but pretty close actually. He's working on shelter vehicles now in Green Pea parking lots. And they had a deal with Green Pea, at least theoretically worked out. It was going to be costed that it was you know going to basically save money. But then the building code came in and said, actually, for this to be legal, you have to spend 10 times as much. The thing is, the building code does not have any fines or anything. If you have no walls and no ceiling and no floor and no door, the completely null structure does not violate the building code. Um, this is an idea I would probably run by some finer legal minds, but it's interesting to me to consider what if you expanded the building code to include the null structure so that the building code would actually fine people for, uh, uh, or fine sort of the government for not providing housing to people. This is kind of like doctors prescribing food in, in, instead of drugs. It is uh, you know, out of the box. Um, but I, I think that you could actually, um, you know, include the null structure in the building code in this. It would be unacceptable to have no structure around someone. Thank you so much. Yeah, housing is a human right. I'm I'm there for that, Adam. Yeah, I hope. So let's move along to our, our last set of questions. Um, I did previously call this uh, City Hall Culture, but I'm going to rename it. We're going to call it uh, Cleaning Up City Hall. Um, Ebony, you go ahead. And I actually have two questions, but I'm going to let you go first because ladies first. And then you guys can answer the three questions and then we can debate because I think this is going to be... Um, a little bit of a, a bigger discussion. Go ahead. The gravy train. How about that one? Do we feel like city councilors are paid too much? And then on top of that, do they get too many perks? We're talking parks pass, bus pass, 
free parking, um, cabs from certain events, and even housing subsidiaries. Is this fair? And my two questions, the first one is actually brand new. I've never done this in, in any of the debates because this just happened. Um, should a sitting councillor who's running for re-election and criminally charged be allowed to continue his re-election <laughs> bid? And um, as, as Adam pointed out earlier, um, there's a public outcry uh, based on her role in the encampment clearings in Trinity Bellwoods, uh, Alexandra and Lamport, there's a community outcry to fire Tracy Cook, who's the interim city manager. Uh, how do you respond to this and why? We'll let uh, Pierre go first and then Adam and then Axel, you can finish it off. Go ahead, Pierre. Wow, so there's, uh, there's, there's, there's three or four big questions here. And so uh, uh, Ebony had the uh, Ebony had the assertions about uh, whether uh, councillors are paid too much or not, and whether they're compensated correctly or not. I would say that uh, I would say it looks about right to me. One hundred and fifteen grand for uh, employment. That's that's not much to me. Sorry, Tracy Cook, who uh, we're talking about. I'm laughing because Adam's done changed his yeah, name. Okay, <laughs> but um, so you know, Tracy Cook actually received a um a pay raise of 13 percent over the, the past year, and um, at the last I checked, you can look it on the Sunshine List. Her payment was like three hundred eight thousand dollars, a hundred thousand, three hundred eight hundred thousand dollars for her annual salary. And then she received another $14,000 in benefits. And then of course the perks. So that, that put that in perspective, not all counselors are paid the same, but that is the high end of it. Uh, is that too much? I exceeded that level during my uh, tenure. It's uh, I'm on the sunshine list. You can look at me. The, uh, this doesn't look like a lot of money, $115,000. I would say that if I was doing that job that I'm, I'm doing the, uh, <laughs> I would say that I, I, I'm working to help. That, that's what I would say. And so they, uh, I don't know. You guys want to talk about Tracy Cook, I think. The uh, no, like they, uh, there were there were there were there were two other questions. So there were the question about the the sitting councillor facing criminal charges being allowed to continue his bid for re-election, and then there was the 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 Tracy Cook thing. So I would say, what are the rules? So what are the rules? Can uh, so what are the current rules? Before you say what's right, one needs to examine what the rules are. Well, if I guess person, I. I I guess I'm just if asking for, for your opinion. If a person has been charged with, uh, with uh, sexual misconduct or whatever, if they've been charged with anything, it has not been proven in a court of law what the situation is. We, we don't know. So, so, so trying, to, trying to judge, like, so, so the public then would then be allowed to be judge jury and executioner without any evidence at all i say no i say what are the rules is he allowed to run or isn't he uh, and if he's allowed to run under the current rules then i think that that should just continue he should just carry on and finish out his term fin finish out his election and the public will decide and as far right. as Tr tracy cook is concerned or maybe perhaps scandal will be forgotten in time well what do you want to talk about with this Tracy Cook. So she makes a lot of money. I so, don't really care. No, no, like, so, I, I so, don't give a shit if so she my, makes a lot of money. What so are my, her responsibilities? So my, if my, her responsibilities are co-measure with her pay, then I see no problem at all. So my, I, my question my question was because of the public outcry for her to fi get fired, uh, how do you respond to that and why? Well, what's the rationale? What's the what is the reason why you want to behind the encampments being d dissolved the way and in the manner that they were so whether or not so, you feel like totally responsible so, is it a, a taken the blame this is a political problem this is not a problem with a civic employee this is a political issue this is a failure 
of politicians in Toronto to, to have a vision that's bold enough to solve this problem. And firing Tracy Cook is not going to do anything to get one single person off of the street. If you want to get the people off the street, then you need to copy Finland's idea. You need to have some place for them to go first. You can't pull people out of their tents. Living in the street, you've got families living in the street. You simply can't pull people out of their tents and, 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 and do what they executed. This is a political issue. They have, the politicians have no way to solve it. They have, they have no vision uh, and they, they simply haven't, they haven't resolved the problem. The problem is that there's no beds. You're unsafe. You'll be robbed and beaten up. This is in the opinion of the police. But how can we, how can we tell those people who are living in homeless encampments that they're supposed to leave the tent that they're in or the cubicle they've built or whatever, the plywood thing. Like, how can we tell anyone to, to leave those places when, they, uh, when we have no place for them to go? It's, uh, they, these people are suffering mental illness. They, they, they have no address. How can you get a job when you're living on the street? There is no way out. The, this, this problem has to be solved. And the solution is by applying housing first with a funding mechanism. Well, it's obvious. Fund it with the carbon tax, fully funded. We need to bring this to the prime minister and we need to, I, have you walked down Hastings Street in Vancouver? I can tell you right now that Tr Trinity Bellwoods is a fucking paradise next to Hastings Street in Vancouver. It's, it is just a disaster. And, and they've given up trying to clear them out. It's impossible. <laughs> so I, I, I just simply won't deal. I'm not going to get into some sort of hatred for some person, a city manager, trying to do her job under impossible circumstances. She, she with, without a political vision to end the homeless crisis in Toronto and in Vancouver and Calgary, Montreal, Halifax, this problem needs to be ended. We cannot look down our noses at these people anymore. These people are no better and no worse than anyone else in our society. We have to help them. Thank you so much. Adam, go ahead. Oh, I thought, I thought it was Axel than me. Oh, was that what we said? If you want to pass it to Axel and go last, you're you can I'm, do that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure like you have a lot to say and Tracy Cook. Um, do, do you want me, uh, Axel, before you start, do you want uh, the questions repeated? Uh, I think I got them. Uh, okay. it's, it's, and, and my answer is quick. Uh, counselors do get too many perks. I think if you're getting paid over $100,000 and you can't afford to buy your own TTC pass, uh, there's something wrong there. Um, I don't know why they get a housing allowance. They're supposed to live in the ward that they work, uh, that, they, that they represent. Uh, so they do get too many, too, too many perks and, and they should be banned. Or they, I would they beg to, to differ be on that. That's not okay. true. Uh, you can, that's you, why you got to speak. That's, speak that's why you got to speak before. <laughs> well, I thought it was a debate. No, no, it will be a debate. Just uh, once everyone answers the questions, then it's an open floor. It's a free for all. Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the, I'm sure uh, you're asking your question about um, being able to continue uh, running as a candidate because of the news of uh, the deputy mayor, uh, Michael Thompson. Um, I do think that he morally uh, needs to resign and he should remove himself from uh, the run. Uh, however, I, I do think that there's a due process and unless he's, he's, fine, he's found guilty, uh, before a court of law, uh, he, he, he doesn't have to, and, 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 moral, and, 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 and it's right for him to stay, uh, stay his course. Uh, although uh, morally, I think 100% he should resign. Um, on the firing of Tracy Cook, uh, I am indifferent. I think that if you want her fire, you should do that at the next election and do not vote for the mayor 
uh, Corey. Thank you. Go ahead, Adam. Okay, well, on the gravy train, um, counselors make what I often refer to in the case of many professions, uh, what I call a don't bribe me wages. And um, this factor, this calculation is left out of most people's assessment of this, but it is there in the people who are setting the wages because, um, well, they may have experienced bribes themselves for one thing and they know at what price they were bribed at. It doesn't mean they want other people to be bribed. They just want maybe, and this is in the case where they have someone who would be bribed themselves and there's other people who would never accept a bribe and they definitely want other politicians to have don't bribe me wages. Um, if, if you only paid uh, city councilors, you know, minimum wage, it would be very, very, very easy to bribe them. Someone who makes a little bit more than minimum wage would have a bit of extra to give them, you know, so to speak. And um, the benefits, the perks, because they're not as fungible as money, like I actually like the perks more than the money because it, it, the only way for them to use the perks is for them to actually use city services. So basically, because if you, if you said, imagine you're a TTC marketer, essentially, and you say, what could you do to make someone who makes 120 grand a year take the subway instead of an Uber? The answer is almost nothing, except you could make it free. Then they might do it. But you know what? You still like the TTC pass is such a funny thing because I, I'm just I'm wondering, has anyone ever seen a city councilor on the subway? I actually think uh, back in the day, I, I saw David Miller on the subway. Good for him. I don't know if he if he paid for the pass himself, but so basically th that perk is not being used. You know, if anything, we should pay the city councilors to take the subway so they know what it's like, except that's not what it's like. What it's like is that you pay 325 and that 325 because of the diminishing marginal utility of money is worth a lot more to you than 325 is to them. So if anything, I mean, you could have a system where councillors have to pay the same percentage of their salary for everything, but that's, you know, radical price controls and not that kind of socialist. I just like social programs. Anyway, so the gravy train is, is maybe a bit uh, counterintuitive. Um, you might think that they're, them being paid so much is corruption, but them being paid so much actually prevents corruption because it's what I call it, don't bribe me wages. Um, <clears throat> Michael Thompson, well, um, Pierre said something like, oh, well, handing it over to the people to become judge, jury, and executioner. Well, I, I mentioned the chat at that time that something called Condorcet's jury theorem is relevant there. What Condorcet proved during the French Revolution is that um, if each voter is better than chance, as the size of the jury, um, sorry, if each voter is better than chance, you can make the jury arbitrarily accurate by making it arbitrarily large. That doesn't mean there won't be a temporary dip as you add jurors, but basically if you need 90% accuracy, you can keep adding jurors and you'll eventually get there as long as the jurors are better than chance. So now this raises the question, is a randomly selected citizen better than chance at assessing the guilt of uh, Councillor Thompson, uh, maybe not. But I would point out that that's actually what that question turns on. If you want to throw it to public opinion, and actually because of the way this theorem works, it depends on whether people are on average uh, better than flipping a coin. If a random person is better than a coin at assessing Michael Thompson, then um, in at least in the limit case, as the jury increases, you get more accuracy. Um, this is why you don't have, at the very least, you don't have a jury of two people in the court. You have a jury of at least more than that. You know, um, there might be practical limits, but in online and in elections, that's where we have a very large jury. And uh, arguably that's why voter turnout is so important, not just because it's good for the leftists or whatever, but because it's actually good for the truth. And that's what Condorcet's jury theorem proved in the French Revolution, which is, you know, the time when they were all getting more dedicated to democracy over like the, you know, the tyranny of Marie Antoinette and friends or whatever. Um, okay, so <clears throat> that's on, um, well, that's part of the, okay, that's one point about Michael Thompson. I mean, um, it's obviously very concerning. And, you know, I had the job to call around with the dirt on Kevin Vuong when Norm, my opponent now, was running for Susanna Fort York and I was campaigning for Norm when I worked for the ONDP. Yeah, Axel is laughing. It's really funny, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, now Norm did tell me that that wasn't his idea to do that. And I believe him because who would really want people doing that? Um, but it was someone's idea and that's what we did. We cold called people. Some of you, if you live in Trinity Spana, may have received the calls that said, guess what? We've got dirt on Kevin Vuong. And uh, I mean, we didn't actually say it like that, but that's, you know, that's my summary. And um, <laughs> one woman said, wow, that's amazing news. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> He's saying, um, and unfortunately, this is how some people might treat the Michael Thompson news um, in the Socialist Alliance. We have someone running against him, uh, Kiri, who is, you know, an ACORN activist and has a, he, with, with Thompson's accusation, it may have changed 
from me having a better shot than Kiri to Kiri having a better shot than me at winning on October 24th. And that's just the facts, regardless of what you think about what he should do or what happened or anything like that, um, which is interesting to say the least. And the timing is suspicious. I mentioned to Matt at the beginning that if someone's goal were really to uh, in increase safety in the community, they would probably want this to come out as soon as possible. If their goal was to affect the election, you would say, well, maybe they would leave it to the last to the last minute so that there's no time for the trial to happen until the elections already happened. Now you could say, if it's a legitimate uh, thing, then that doesn't mean they don't want it to affect the election. So it's a bit of a false binary. But if it's just if it is just um, you know um, sabotage for the sake of sabotage, then the timing is in line with that. So the timing doesn't rule it out being sabotage. Um, and uh, I would say we should all watch it very closely. It is reasonable for the cup, the public can't unhear what it's heard. So um, they will factor that into their vote. And I think if anything, <clears throat> it um, behooves us all for um, there to be more information that reaches the voter. Because right now people are gonna act on a prejudice and um, the faster the courts can do this, the better. But as I was saying, the timing was clearly chosen to make it impossible for the courts to provide us with that information. The court of public opinion is often very remiss in actually um, seeking out um, conflicting reports, like a judge has to actually look both parties in the eye and see them in the same room and the contradiction has to happen in the same room and the, and the judge doesn't have the luxury of avoiding the cognitive dissonance of not wanting to hear both sides of a story. Everyone has a duty, if they're going to participate in the court of public opinion, to cultivate a taste for dissonance. Musical dissonance is helpful in this, but cognitive dissonance is what we're talking about. And the emancipation of dissonance in music um, has not <laughs> caught on very fully. Schoenberg is not that popular yet. Um, nor is uh, the distance of different uh, ideas, but uh, distance between different ideas of people that you know very popular. People tend to be tribal, and they go into polarized camps of political purity where they don't want they want to hear a chord ringing in their tribe, but they don't want to hear a sour note that doesn't fit with that. And you know, logic doesn't tell you how to resolve those distances. Neither does counterpoint. It just tells you these are distances. They need resolution. Obviously, there is a dissonance between the counselor saying he is innocent and someone else saying he is guilty. That is a very dissonant thing to experience. And most people would prefer to hear a consonant chord. They want to hear one side of it. And that is not what our duty uh, uh, is. Our, our duty is to, is to sit with that dissonance. And as a collective, we have to do that. The newspapers have to talk about it. People have to talk about it. Anyone who knows anything needs to talk, you know, if they can only talk privately. The conversation needs to happen the truth needs to come out whatever that is and unfortunately we don't really have enough time for all the truth to come out um okay so that brings us to tracy cook um there is a petition online called fire tracy cook it is on uh, change.org uh, i encourage you all to sign it i'm going to just read you a few quotes from that petition um <clears throat> this is um um this is what pastor doug said of sanctuary he said Trump, on twitter originally he said Toronto deputy city manager took responsible, responsibility for this entire issue, meaning the encampment clearings and the mass violence, at the last council meeting. Is there any good reason at all that council should not ask for her resignation immediately for misleading them and taking steps to skirt clear rules? So that those are some of the accusations in addition to like the nitty gritty of what happened. Now, here's a quote from Matt Elliott, who, whose blog, a city hall watcher, you should all, uh, it's also required reading guys, uh, city hall watcher in the SHJN report. Um, this is he's quoting cook at first in this tweet he says quote anything related to enforcement is not subject to counsel or counselors unquote says cook saying people upset with encampment evictions should spare counselors and quote unquote point their ire uh, unquote at her so this is what she said she herself now you might say that she was paid to take the fall or whatever i, I would like to see the evidence no one else is saying that they're responsible <laughs> i mean john bernstein's running for re-election like he did a good thing so uh, that's a, you know, that's a, a real, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know how he thinks that. Um, and I just want to read you what you can also read on my blog uh, called What I Said About Tracy, subtitled Fire Tracy Cook. Um, this is this is from a conversation I had with Philip Mills in, uh, in our little, uh, chat room that we started on Facebook about Trump politics. So uh, I had said, everyone, please sign candidates. If you don't know why we're firing Tracy Cook, um, ask me for more information. And, you know, Isabella gave a thumbs up. But Philip said, actually, if you have some more information, I could use it. I've heard of Tracy Cook. and I know she has something to do with the encampment sweeps last year, which that in itself should be disqualifying. But I don't know what her role was. Actually, I guess clarification of her role wouldn't make it any less culpable. And this is what I said. I said, Burnside was under Cook, was under Murray, was under Tory. For those events, the zero encampments motion came from Holy Day. The links in the petition are very important, as is all of the general footage in the hashtag evict John Tory playlist, which documents all these events. If you want to be an informed voter, please watch the entire playlist. If we could clockwork orange strap everyone down and make them watch it, Tory would lose in a heartbeat. 
Um, okay, so this was one of my answers um, I said to Philip uh, to the STARS vote compass. Quote, all of the candidates of the Socialist Alliance.ca are committed to defunding by 50% along with a number of specific reforms. You can also see my personal recommendations for police reform at uh, my blog, you can and find the song, uh, for cancel half and cut the cops in half. The price tag for ongoing encampment enforcement is approaching 50 million the last I heard. Police spending should go exclusively toward reducing violence. Sleeping in a park is not a violent crime. One measure of the effectiveness of police spending is its effect on response time. Encampment enforcement could only have impaired response time by wasting funds, fueling the control freak fantasies of the likes of Team Tory, including Mayor John, Chris Murray, Tracy Cook, and John Burnside, all of whom are authoritarians who need to go. Thank God Murray is act already stepping down. Other than him, these are all former cops working for the city manager. No wonder we manage our city with such a heavy hand. And another uh, response I gave to the star, I was one of over 30 activists arrested on the scene at Lamport 2, the violent mass eviction of the Lamport Stadium, Stadium encampment. Lamport 1 was a mere attempt the city had made before being fought off by activists and before passing a zero encampments motion, along with a unanimous motion to take a quote unquote human rights approach to encampments, conveniently passing over the idea that housing is a human right, and then violently clearing three large encampments, Trinity, Alexandra, and Lamport 2, all to the tune of tens of billions of dollars. I was there all three days after the motion and the scene was always horrific. People who had five objects to their name now had nothing. A young girl's arm was broken by the police. I met a professor a few moments after police had given her a concussion. As I explained on my blog, the city manager's office gave those with a moral compass no option but to object and the police had no option but to follow through. So your city manager's office could have predicted what ensued except they forgot that people who have a moral compass still exist in this city. Dozens of people were arrested, directly harmed, ticketed, or charged at these three violent mass evictions, which ran contrary to the will of the people in that we had just had a unanimous vote to take a human rights approach. The indirect harm falls on tens of thousands of Torontonians, and it was enacted by none other than John Tory, Chris Murray stepping down, Tracy Cook needs to be fired, John Burnside don't vote for him, and Stephen Holyday vote him out, zero encampments was his motion. The psychic harm goes further, and this city will be healing for a century. If you want to know what really happened that day, look up the hashtag Evict John Tory playlist on YouTube and send me any videos I might be missing from this archive of events. The truth is what you should base your vote on. Watch all of it. All right, Adam, let's bring everybody in. Anyone who wants to uh, debate, let's let's uh, this. This is why we're here. Go ahead. Firing Tracy Cook will do nothing to solve the homeless crisis. Firing Tracy Cook is an utter waste of time. Worse. She made it worse. Firing her makes it better. She's going to keep making it worse. You also have to penalize that behavior. Otherwise, someone else will think they can do that and not get fired. Penalize what behavior? What are you talking about? She, she said, if you don't like how the encampment clearings happen, you should direct uh, your ire at her. That's well, right. People are upset. And she so said, what do you have her. that makes any sense about why she's not doing her job? She's Pardon? just doing her job. Wh whose fault is it? It's yours. Excuse me? Yeah, you. Why, what did you, I do? All you're doing is whining like a big baby. No, I wasn't whining before the clearings. What? Get your temporal priority straight, Pierre. This is basic logic. No, it's not. There's no logic to what Causes you... precede effects, don't they? What? Is this, is this part of the physics you learned to work at OPG? Try your metaphysics out. Causes precede effects. I didn't cause the encampment clearings. This is my reaction to them. Get your facts straight to provide any vision about how the homeless crisis might you just be went solved. through all this you're going back to our first topic we're talking about tracy cook not how to solve homelessness Stay on the top. issue is about homelessness you said the again this is stunting the creativity of your thought which is usually quite enjoyable there is more than one issue i've told you this five times on twitter i've sent you articles about the theory of descriptions of version russell you need to read it you need to expand your education out of an engineer's education it's not, this is why they didn't teach engineers what they needed in the Soviet Union to understand politics. You have no Same idea what you're talking about. No idea. I have, I have every idea what, about what I just said. No. Well, that's easy to say. I'm so, I, can't, I can't talk to you anymore. I know you can't. I, I'm pretty clear. Firing Tracy Cook is a waste of time. You're, and, he was a waste of time. You're an idiot to chase that down. This is I know just my IQ? a waste of time, and it is not in the public interest. I think well, you she should. She made things worse. Stop. 
if, if, if removing a problem is part of a solution. Things worse is providing some sort of vision to solve the homeless. Her vision. She doesn't have a vision. You don't have a vision. But once again, we went through this at the beginning, and you haven't even re read the, the plan. So they have a vision that you're not listening to. Or better. They're on the ground. You're not. And you have zero vision about uh, your count. idea. Is your arithmetic is wrong. Why should I listen to this, this dribble? I don't want to listen to this dribble neither. No, then you shouldn't have shown up here. We could have had a more productive conversation at this point. Is is it makes no sense? You have but no. Doesn't. I can explain it to you if you're having difficulty. You not one shred of reason <laughs> to support your assertion. Once again, you can't count very well. This is it. <laughs> is it? Is there a one shred or how many shreds of reason does someone generally have? How do you count the shreds? I mean. You say the when there are many things. You say the issue. This is your attempt to pivot back to what you want to talk about because it's where you feel more comfortable. But you have to understand that these are what are called wicked problems. You can't reduce things to this kind of this you know, is linear just, way of thinking. I'll, this is just another infantile expression of stupidity. Well, I know you're old, but I'm not an infant. I'm turning 40 this year. Whatever. I think we've told each Whatever. other. Whatever. That's what a teenager would say, Pierre. <clears throat> Now he's being infantile. Okay, uh, Axel, do you want to jump in or probably doesn't? <laughs> I do not. I, this is quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> like I said, if you, want, if you if if somebody wants uh, to fire Tracy Cook, they should vote uh, John Tory uh, out of office in the next elections. John Tory is doing an excellent job. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure that opinion is going to fly. But um, yeah, as long as you don't want to see John Tory in, we've got to do something. What was it you said, Matt? Um, a vote for John Tory is a vote for John Tory. And uh, and a person who does not vote is also a vote for John Tory. There we go. So things have not been working the way we've been doing it. So I think it's time to mix it up and shake it up. Also, but, every, but, but everybody is entitled to their own opinion. And I respect that. Now, uh, let's move on. We're going to do a closing uh, statement. Uh, Adam, why don't you go first? Axel, you can follow, and Pierre, you'll close, and then uh, and then we'll be done here. Go ahead, Adam. Ward 11 voters, um, you'll note who didn't come out to this debate, and I'm not going to give them any more free advertising. You know who they are, but what you might not know is that they all don't live here. And that's one reason they didn't show up this debate because they want to have that conversation. Now, they will have that conversation if they show up on Monday at Cecil Community Center, where I imagine Axel and Pierre will be there. And I will certainly be there. Some members of the Socialist Alliance will be there. Maybe some other of our other candidates will show up. Um, you can ask us your questions casually afterwards, of course. I will stick around. I'm not going to, you know, um, debate and dash. <laughs> Is that a crime? Um, I, I, and I, I really encourage everyone to find every way that they can participate. Um, you know, I, I last read out that Tracy Cook uh, letter or, you know, article um, on uh, an event that we are having on Sunday that you can all attend, viewers and candidates alike, um, citizens, non-voters, you know, illegal immigrants, um, Sundays at 6 p.m. Socialist Town Hall. Um, we had a very long conversation. We talked about a lot of this stuff. We're going to do it every week until the election. Um, and uh, I'll see you there at Socialist Town Hall Sundays at 6 p.m. Thank you very much. Uh, Axel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, just following following up on, on Adam's remarks, uh, we're all residents of University of Rosedale. Uh, you should vote for somebody that, that has uh, your corner. Uh, we're not here, or I'm not here, uh, chasing a job or trying to try and try and better luck because uh, I wasn't elected in the in the last provincial elections. Uh, we need leaders that are not in love with the fame or the power or the money. Uh, but they're in love with uh, justice and humanity. Um, go out and vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for, but uh, I hope you do give me the opportunity to work for you and uh, make Toronto a brighter city. Thank Love you. Your socials. Where can we find you guys on the internet or social media? What are your yes. websites? My website is uh, my name, my last name, axelorvisa.com. Thank you. Um, Pierre, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the opportunity to express my view. Um, I my main platform idea is my solution for climate change, which I uh, I'm obviously trying to push through 
to the provincial and the federal levels, you know, from by, by you know, inflaming the idea in the public eye. The idea that we can control climate change is, is my main platform. And, uh, and a vote for me is a vote to control climate change. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And uh, to my listeners, I just want to say, you know, voting day is October 24th. The uh, early voting is the 7th to the 14th. And I truly believe the only way to affect change is to be part of it. Uh, everyone should vote. Doesn't it, Like Axel said, it doesn't matter who you vote for. Everyone should vote, especially the young people. Um, yeah. Well, if you don't vote, you don't get to whine later. That's not how this works. Shut up. With the whining and the tweeting, I'm I'm one of those young people who's not so young anymore. I'm I'm suddenly 33 and a Karen, and like I was, you know, helping with Acorn protesting most of my like my late 20s. But you'd be surprised until like you get shut out into the world and suddenly can't afford anything and mommy doesn't pay your bills. Kids don't care, youth don't care, and they don't think it directly affects them. But I'm here to tell you that it does. You don't have to have children to to care about daycare you don't have to have you know have to pay to work two jobs to pay your rent to care about minimum wage it's going to come down to everybody everybody has to pull their weight here and everybody's got to get out and vote thank you ebony and i want to thank you guys all for coming out and and doing this uh debate i i really uh i really i love it you know and i'm excited to see what happens for the city of toronto and for ward 11 um and that's all for tonight Thank you guys so much for coming. There we go, guys. Uh, it's all done. It should be up uh, within the hour. I'm going to go eat some pizza and then uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out and it'll be out there. Um, the recording. No, no, that's not me anymore. That's, um, that's, that's me, but we're about to end <laughs> this anyway. Yeah, don't, don't say your credit card number or anything. I'll see you all on Monday. <laughs> um, <laughs> Adam, sorry what's your twitter twitter handle uh it's uh i don't know uh it's this time in history but i had to i had to like uh uh put it in a weird way because someone had taken this time in history so it's actually uh it's at history underscore this tm which i hate but that was the best of what was available awesome i'll look it up Absolutely. And I will tag, if you're on Twitter, I'll find you and I'll, I'll, um, I'll tag all of you in it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I can't wait to see what happens. I'm going to be in North Carolina on election day, but uh, I'll, I'll still be paying attention. I told my wife, I said, because uh, we're supposed to go to Myrtle Beach that day. And I'm like, that's fine. We'll do whatever you want. But that night we're, we're going to, I'm going to be on my computer in the hotel room. I'm going to be busy. So find something to do. By the way, if anyone's free tomorrow, we're going to wander the streets or possibly bike the streets singing Evict John Tory. This is the, the new score on the new edition of my platform. So if you need a this, PDF, I'll send it to you. I delivered this, this score to every office in the music faculty. And is I this happening? I recalled when I was distributing this outside of a film about music censorship in the Soviet Union. Is this happening in your ward? Well, honestly, our plan is not that organized yet. I'm joining some kind of bike thing that's probably going all over the city at one point. I mean, it's a long night, but the point is we're going to see what we can do. I mean, not just tonight, but until election day to see this meme. Sorry, my, my blurring background is making it hard to read, but, you know, like, many of the people. Bike, like bike pirates used to put on a whole bike rave. I think they retired a couple of years ago, but tell me that someone has taken up the helm and it's a bike rave are you gonna put little glow sticks on the bikes please there has been a bike rave happening and my friend i told her to talk to bike pirates as well and cinecycle and david shelna to try to get them on board and she was like wow those are great ideas i'm like yeah talk to all these bike forces oh my god bike rave was like literally the best experience in my entire life no drugs needed just bells and glow sticks i tell you the bike rave was amazing i hope that they bring it back all right, guys. I'm, I'm starving. I'm right. starving. Yeah, I gotta go. He's a hungry man, folks. You guys have a great evening. Uh, at, um, guys, uh, well, you know what? If I can make it on Sunday, I will. Um, Ebony, I will. Uh, we'll we'll talk uh, tomorrow. All right. All right. See you soon, folks. Bye bye.